Could you open in prayer? Lord, I thank you for this morning, for a chance to come together and gather together in your house. Uh, I thank you for this place of worship uh, and how nice it is. We're very blessed. Thank you that it's nice and warm and comfortable, unlike many others around the world. And yet people could go anyway. Thank you for these people who have gathered, and uh, I pray for later that uh, all of the congregation gathers for the morning service. Thank you for Keith and for all that he does uh, in teaching and preaching and, and for Mary and all her ministry. And <clears throat> I just pray that you'll continue to bless them. And uh, thank you for this time and bless this time that we would all benefit from it. In Christ's name, amen. So, I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then someone else gets it. Maybe Midori. Okay. Uh, Colossians 1. And although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds, but now he reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly grounded and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of, I, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and I fill up what is lacking of Christ's afflictions in my flesh on behalf of his body, which is the church, of which I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God given to me for you, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what, his, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we, we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to his working, for which he works in me in power. Okay, so last week we actually finished up, we actually did verse 23, where we saw that we are firmly grounded and steadfast, or that that's what our continuing on the faith is supposed to be, that we're not supposed to be double-minded, that we're not supposed to be tossed to and fro. Today we're going to look at um, 24 and at, through uh, 27 in this, and there's a lot in here. Um, one of the things uh, Paul talks about rejoicing in his sufferings. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. And Paul brings that out in Romans very clearly, where he talks about, in Romans 5, 3 through 5, he says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And our hope doesn't make us ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. So we see that there's this progressive list of items going on. And Paul's talking about suffering, which is the same kind of thing here. And he says, I rejoice in my suffering." Notice, Paul isn't talking about something theoretical. He isn't talking about something that is for you, but not for me. Or, as they say, for thee, but not for me. 
the whole idea Paul is saying is, I rejoice in my sufferings. So Paul is talking about this experientially. He's talking about this because he's experienced it himself. And he says this also in Philippians 1, 13 through 18. He says, So that my chains in Christ have become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. That's the Roman guard, guard. And to everyone else, and that most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord because of my chains, have far more courage to speak of the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that, if, that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause my affliction in my chains. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. We see here Paul talking about the, the Roman guard, how they came to be brothers. Remember, Paul was in chains, but he wasn't chained to a wall. He was chained to guards. They were a captive audience. They had to listen. Some of them came to Christ as a result. And it's not just the preaching Paul did, but it's the life he lived. Here he is living in chains, living out the impossible. And showing a joy in his sufferings. If you're there and you're seeing this every day. And you can't get away from it. Eventually you're going to wonder what is it that makes this man tick. And that's one of the things about Paul's sufferings. That's why he rejoiced in the sufferings. Because other people came to Christ as a result a direct result. And then he goes on and talks about people that are preaching Christ out of goodwill. But then he talks about people that are preaching Christ simply to cause him pain. And he says, it's not working. Instead, I rejoice because Christ is preached. That's the amazing thing about what Paul's getting at here is that he's rejoicing in his sufferings because of the gospel, because it does. And then he goes on and he talks about filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in my flesh. Somebody want to read 2 Corinthians 1, 5. For, for just as the sufferings of Christ abound to us, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Notice here something that Paul's getting at here in Corinthians. He talks about suffering abounding. He talks about the fact that suffering is more. But what is it accompanied by? It says right here, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. See, the suffering comes with comfort. Paul in, in Corinthians um, says also that we suffer so that we can comfort others with the comfort that we have already been comforted. So we see that Paul is getting at something here, that this is working in us, this suffering, this difficulty. It's working in us something that with the comfort, makes us better somehow. 
That's a miracle that God takes something as filthy as I am, somehow manages to give me his righteousness through the death on the cross, and then starts cleaning me up. And suffering is part of that process. Sometimes it's suffering for things that I've done that are just plain stupid. Sometimes there appears to be no reason, as we saw in, or as we see in the book of Job, where for no apparent reason Job suffered. Yet in the end result, he said, I heard of you before, but now... I see you with my eyes. He had a better understanding of God after going through all that suffering. That's one of the things about suffering that we paradoxically, it, it, it seems paradoxical that suffering would draw us closer. But in a very real way, it does draw us closer. Somebody want to read 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. It comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree you are sharing the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Remember in the Gospels, Jesus repeatedly tells his disciples, they're going to hate you because they hate me. Well, generally speaking, if you're with a bunch of people that hate you, you're not enjoying it. There's a certain amount of suffering here. And, and Peter's getting at this, where he talks about um, this fiery trial which comes for your testing as, through, as though some strange thing happened. Then he talks about you're sharing the sufferings of Christ. Now when Christ suffered, he suffered to make me clean. When I suffer, it is a part of that cleansing process. It's part of sanctification. See, sanctification is twofold. There is an act of sanctification. He set us apart. He made us a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That sanctification, he took us out of one thing and put us over in another thing. He took us out of the kingdom of the world and put us into the kingdom of heaven. That's the act. We have been sanctified. But there is also a process. We are being sanctified. And that means that there's this daily walk where we are experiencing things in our lives that draw us closer to him and make us more like him. That's what Peter's getting at here, that this whole thing about these fiery trials and these sufferings and, and being in the world, but not of the world. looking for that kingdom whose builder is God. Living a kingdom life right here and now. And then he goes on. Somebody want to read um, 1 Corinthians 12.26. And if one member suffers, all the members su all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So we're seeing here, and this is in verse 24, he talks about his suffering 
on behalf of the body which is in the church. And in Corinthians, he talks about this a lot. But right here, he's talking, and he says, if one member suffers, the whole body suffers. We see that in our own bodies, especially as we get older. Our joints creak. Our back aches. All these different parts of our body start falling apart. And they're suffering. And the whole of us suffers right along with it. But the same thing is true when, when in terms of the body of Christ, when somebody experiences genuine blessed joy, we all rejoice with them, such as the birth of a child such as all sorts of other things that happen, such as seeing someone come to know Christ. All these things cause us to rejoice. All of us. Especially for the new babe in Christ. When that happens. That we can help support and nurture a young Christian. And then Paul continues on, and he talks about this in verse 25. He says, of which I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. And you'll notice something here. I, I put this in here from MacArthur's study, our Bible study. It's a, it's a note that he has on this verse. And he says, that a steward is a slave who manages his master's household. Remember, Joseph was a steward managing Potiphar's household. And we see that also. And in Galatians, he talks about the law being a child instructor. The, the term in Greek is pedagogus, which actually was a steward in charge of the education of the children, a slave. Wasn't necessarily a willing thing for them. They had to do it. And Paul's getting at this when he talks about himself being a steward. He was made a steward, or made a minister according to the stewardship of God. God appointed him. Somebody want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17. For if I proclaim the gospel, I have nothing to boast, if I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship to me. So Paul is getting at that right there. He's talking about this compulsion that he has. He said, if I was doing this willingly, I'd get a reward for it. But no, this is a compulsion. This is something that basically, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And he's talking about the stewardship of this message, uh, the stewardship of in this case, a mystery. And he defines that later on. But I wanted to also read Galatians, or Mary, can you read Galatians 1, 14 and 15? And I was advanced, advancing in Ju Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being far more zealous for traditions of my fathers. But when God, who had set me apart, from my father's womb and called me through his grace was pleased. Okay, so we see something rather interesting here. Paul was a man going places. He was very successful at being a Pharisee. He was very successful outstripping his fellow Pharisees. Being more zealous for the Jewish traditions. I'm going places, man. That's what he's saying here. But, 
love when Paul uses the but because he always brings it to an abrupt halt. He says here, but when God had set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was well pleased. From his mother's womb, God had called him. Long before he became that man going places, God called him. Jeremiah also voices this compulsion. Do you want to read that? Before I formed you in the innermost parts, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I set you apart. I have given you as a prophet to the nations. So we see again, being set apart in Jeremiah, being sanctified, that act that becomes the process. And then he goes on, he says, so that I may carry out the preaching of the word of God in verse 25. And I wanted to read Jeremiah 20, verse 9 here. And this is Jeremiah saying this. Now he's been told he's been called out before he was born. And now in chapter 20, verse 9, he says, But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more his name, Then, in my heart, it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in and cannot prevail. That's the compulsion. That's a description of the compulsion. That's how it is. It burns me inside because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's what Paul felt. That's why he was talking about this as a stewardship, as somebody who has got a responsibility and he needs to fulfill that responsibility. It's not he can fulfill the responsibility, although he rejoices in the fact that he has been made responsible. But he needs to fill that responsibility. It's a compulsion in him. Think after getting stoned and left for dead, he got up and went right back into the city. That's compulsion. And then he goes on and he talks about the mystery. It's interesting. He uses this term a lot. That... In the New Testament, it is actually used in, in the Gospels and other places. But Paul actually defines mystery, both in this passage and in others. Um, the definition of a mystery, and he says this right here in verse 26. He says, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but, now, but has now been manifest. So we see here Paul saying, this is something nobody even dreamed of. But now it's made clear. So what is this mystery Paul is talking about? Well, actually I want to look at another mention of a mystery in Ephesians. Somebody want to read Ephesians uh, chapter 3, 2 through 6. If indeed you heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, about which, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it was now revealed to his apostles and prophets in the Spirit, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs 
of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So we see here, Paul is talking about a, a mystery in the book of Ephesians, but this mystery is different than the mystery that we're going to see in the book of Colossians. This mystery was, first of all, Jesus predicted it in John chapter 10 when he talks about being the good shepherd and having other sheep which are not of the fold of the Jews. And the two shall become one fold with one shepherd. And that's what Paul's talking about here. That's the mystery. Jesus tells them what the mystery is going to be. And then Paul explains this mystery. The Gentiles are going to become part of the body. This goes way back to God's promise to Abraham. In you, all nations will be blessed. We're part of that, all nations. God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled in Christ when he died on the cross. And Paul was talking about this mystery that we are going to have a part in the kingdom. We had no right, but by mercy, God called us. By grace, he brought us into the fold. So what is the mystery he's talking about here in Colossians? Verse 27, it says, To whom God willed to make known what the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this riches? What is this glory? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Christ lives in us. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. He is living in us. He's the one that gives us that moral compass. He's the one that gives us that desire to live for him. He's the one that gives us the power to no longer be slaves to sin. That's what Christ in us, the hope of glory, is all about. He's here every moment of every day, whether we're awake or asleep. Christ in us, the hope of glory. This phrase, riches of glory, it's, Paul uses it twice. Um, he uses it in Ephesians and he uses it in Colossians. In verse 27 where he talks about the mystery um, where it says he made known what are the riches of the glory. The riches of the glory in this case was Christ in us. The hope of glory. But in Ephesians he uses the same phrase the riches of his glory. Of his glory. And here he talks about something far different. Somebody want to read Ephesians 3, verse 8. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the good news of the unfathomable riches of Christ. Okay, so we see this here. And then we continue... But, um, I'm repeating verse 8 in this, but it's verses 7 through 11. I'm going to read this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of his grace, which he caused to abound towards us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. Notice again, he's talking about a mystery here according to his 
good pleasure which he purposed in him for an administration of the fullness of the times that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him we also have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, we have been made an inheritance. It's kind of an interesting phrase. And it's kind of difficult to parse. Is it an inheritance for us? Or have we been made into an inheritance? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that is key. And I think part of this, um, we can see... Hang on. That we can see in verse 18 here. It says here this here. Notice it says, we have been made an inheritance. But then he follows up later on in verse 18 and he says this. So that, y so that you, the eyes of your heart, having been enlightened. So we've been enlightened when we came to Christ. Will know what is the hope of his calling. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Notice here. His inheritance in the saints. In other words, the saints are the Father's inheritance. For an inheritance to happen, a death must occur. That's what wills are all about. When Jesus died on the cross, I inherited something. I inherited God's forgiveness and grace and his righteousness. But God inherited me as a righteous person because Jesus' righteousness was given to me, making me righteous to be able to come before God. So the Father receives an inheritance from the death of Christ every bit as much as I receive an inheritance from the death of Christ. That inheritance is righteousness. That inheritance is me. Depends on who is inheriting what. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you had mercy, that in your goodness you saw our plight, that there was no way out for us because of our sin. And you came and became a human. And you died that I may inherit righteousness and that I may come before the Father. We thank you for this grace, this kindness, this mercy. And we pray that you would help us because of this to live for you, to walk in integrity, to be humble and serve you in our lives, that others may see and ask, what makes that person tick? That we may have the opportunity to say, this is why I can rejoice in difficulties. This is why I can endure suffering and still have a positive attitude. Because Christ is in me the hope of glory. In Jesus' name.